afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Bones and Stones. Today, we've got quite a cool episode. It's a little bit different to our usual. Um, not too long ago, I was asked by someone to come and chat on a podcast about history and topics related to history that are being taught at high school. And we invited the people who run that podcast to join us and chat a bit more about what they're doing. So joining us today is William Polk and Colin Duplessis, and they run something called the High School History Recap. Uh, and the idea here is to cover topics that are taught in history class at school, topics that will benefit class members as well as teachers um, at, other, at other schools too. So thanks very much for joining us. We do appreciate you taking the time, uh, especially considering it's currently load shedding in, in some of the areas you guys in, which adds to the fun of these Mine. <laughs> Um, so maybe just to kick it off, could you just tell us a bit about High School History Recap and, and where it came from and where the idea came from? Okay, well, Colin, if you don't mind, I'll jump in with that one. Um, so, Tim, I actually, I think both of us had this idea in mind to start a podcast. Uh, we were both like avid listeners of some of the podcasts out there. And, um, you know, when, when lockdown started last year, we just said, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen now. And um, I, the, the one day, it was the day just before, you know, the, the country was on lockdown, we recorded our first um, episode. And really from there, it just, it took off. And uh, yeah, it's, it's taken us all over the world. <laughs> mm. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can hear the difference between the first episode that we recorded and the ones that we did recently. It's, it's a oh, completely definitely. different ballgame. The first one we recorded around a little mic on the table and we yeah. had our scripts going and we had those exact words and phrasing that we needed. It's yeah, developed very a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite cool. I didn't but, realize but, that you had yeah. started at, at that period because that's basically mm -hmm. the same as us. We went into lockdown and we thought, hey, oh, okay. let's do something. And this is what we ended up with. Yeah. Yeah, because everyone was kind of talking about how are we going to keep our students occupied? How are we going to keep them academically fit? And then we just thought, well, we enjoy podcasts so much. And if we can allow our kids to listen to these things whenever they want to, whenever they have time, maybe they'll benefit the same way. And eventually it turns out that maybe we can get this type of information out to other students that might not have the same type of access mm -hmm. that, that yeah. online schools have. And are you starting to see that now as well, that your podcasts are reaching a much larger audience? Oh, definitely. Um, well, I must say uh, we had our, uh, call it the, uh, um, the highlight to the first term of last year. So just starting the new year, it's, it's picking up again. But yeah, we've, we've had some feedback all over. I mean, even, uh, you, you know, being a private school and being part of the IB, um, you know, even the, the IB listed us as a, as a resource, oh. a resource to use yeah, uh, for teachers in, in the classroom. So that was quite helpful. Um, and yes, you know, we, so we, we get people that talk to us from all over, ask questions. Um, but, but you know what, what, I, what I've found is that there is actually so much expertise out there, um, uh, you know, and, but people whose voice we, we really need to, to hear uh, and that the, the learners need to hear, the, the students need to hear um, because, you know, the textbook is really very limited when it comes to history and, and the thinking behind it. So like Colin said, you know, it, it was to extend and enrich the, the, the learning experience. Yeah, cool. So then, I mean, because okay, I, I looked at your website and you've got a, a bunch of different speakers that come on. Mm -hmm. So do you kind of identify a topic that's being taught in class and then go and find someone who can speak to that, that topic or a specific question or period in history? I think we more or less try to cover um, the, the, the CAPS curriculum. We, we, that's our starting point in any case. So we really want to um, make it accessible for the, for the learners in the class as well. So that's the starting point. But very often, or, um, sometimes you, you just find that there's something interesting out there, uh, you know, that, that's not taught in the classroom but that we want uh, the learners to be exposed to. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, then we go, we go down that route. Um, and I, I must say some of the episodes that our learners need to listen to as part of the, of the teaching, obviously, um, you know, they'll do that. But we also see that they, they tend to listen to the others as well uh, because it's interesting. Okay. And, and that's what we want to see. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So yeah, I think one of the big things... 
but uh, sorry, yeah, Matt, you want to ask a question? Sorry. Um, yeah, so, so sorry. Thanks, uh, William McCollum. It's incredibly interesting. It's great to hear your your story, your kind of origin story uh, in terms of how you uh, mm. kind of developed the concept of the, the podcast and your, what your original intentions were. Um, mm. I found that quite interesting because, you know, we obviously had similar intentions as well with Bones and Stones and, you know, to try and stay connected with uh, students and, and colleagues during lockdown. Um, so obviously 2020 year, 2020 wasn't a great year, but it was, it was great for obviously developing an online presence. But my question, maybe uh, Colin to bring you in here. Um, do you think you are reaching your targeted audience? So do you think you are getting to the, to the students or are you having a whole pile of other people that you didn't, didn't expect to kind of digest your content? Because at least with Bones and Stones, something that we initially, you know, part of the whole reason why we developed the podcast was to um, attract students and to yeah. just keep them enthused and, and to just share, um, you know, knowledge about archaeological research and stuff. And then we found out that our, our colleagues and fellow academics are actually supporting the channel more and it wasn't really uh, getting to the students. So in, in, in that respect, uh, are you guys reaching the students? Well, I think we are. Um, not as many as we probably want to, but I don't think we've defined exactly what our audience should be. Like we did say we want to get some stuff out there for the students, but half of our stuff's also aimed at teachers. So I know that uh, William's done a lot of episodes on assessment and how to teach certain topics. So I don't, I'm not exactly sure if we've defined exactly who we're trying to reach. So we've reached our local kids um, and then we've seen reaches all over the world so I do think we're reaching some but absolutely not everyone that we want to and I think it's about accessibility as well um, our podcast is available everywhere and it's, it's free but it's still something to do with do you have internet access do you have access to the websites and all those type of things so I think we have reached um, it's a starting point I don't think this is our limit I don't think we should be stopping at reaching a couple of hundred people a week or so um, we'd love to extend it everywhere that's why we have so many different topics so we discuss the and I think uh, William we've spoken about this but these conventional narratives that are being taught in school that's in the CAPS curriculum so we go through what is expected of a certain period in time so for instance we talk about um, the civil rights movement and we have all the boxes that we need to tick and those are the things that get to our students but then we invite guests from outside the conventional narrative like we spoke to dr ashley farmer and uh dr peniel joseph mm -hmm. to allow us to get to some extra things and if we can reach extra people with that people that are not um, interested in just the basic history but looking for something a bit extra then as broad as we possibly can. I don't think we want to limit our, our talk, target audience to kids. I've, of course, that's the, the primary focus, but if it, if it extends to, to other places, the more, the better. Now, Matt, I don't know if you've uh, listened to the podcast that I did with, with them. Um, and we, we spoke a lot about the perception that people have of hunter-gatherers and what you know, we often refer to as Bushmen uh, and, and how that perception, that stereotype that's been created is starting to be undone by a lot of the archaeological work. And, and I really enjoyed that because that type of thinking is the kind of stuff archaeologists want to talk about, especially with younger generations who are coming up you know, and, and actually with the, with the public in general because those stereotypes continue. So do you think that with, with a lot of your talks, are you starting to sort of, I mean, you've mentioned it now, Colin, as well, but broadening students' horizons in terms of how to think about aspects of, the, of history and heritage in different ways, in multiple ways as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, one of the big things that we wanted to, to talk about is that moving away from the conventional narrative. Like when we do talk about early humans and hunter gatherers in South Africa, there's always this limited amount of time that we get to spend on it. So we have these boxes again that we have to tick. We have to describe the koi koi as um, cattle herders, as opposed to the sun being hunter gatherers. And there's never that interplay that we really get to talk about. Um, and I guess that brings us to to topics like archaeology and that podcast that you did with William. It's stuff that we don't get to talk about in the classroom. Um, so it's also not just getting that basic knowledge out in a different form, but adding to the basic knowledge to make it more of a, a deeper type of conversation. Because I think that's what makes the study of the past interesting. It's that detail. And if you have a cursory knowledge of, of what happened and this broad sweeping statements of who uh, thousands of generations of people are, it's not going to really get into the heads of people. You need that, that detail. And hopefully that's something that we can add to the conversation. Yeah, it's, that's a really good point. Also, because, you know, with history and with many other social sciences, but history and archaeology, 
our perspective, our perspectives of the past change, and our understandings of the mm -hmm. past change over time as theory, theories develop, as methods develop, and so on. Um, but maybe we can just bring this tighten up, uh, William, to towards archaeology, because uh, one of the other things we wanted to chat to you about was, was is teaching archaeology or teaching heritage at school. I mean, as history teachers. How much time do you spend talking about archaeology, uh, whether it's human evolution uh, through to tool use and more Iron Age or uh, historic archaeology, colonial occupation of Southern Africa? Do you guys spend a lot of time on those topics? You know what, Tim, what, what we decided to do is, obviously, there, there is the curriculum, and uh, it's more or less expected that you, that you stick to it. But, but in the um, great 10 year and even the great 11 year to, to an extent, you can you can broaden the, the the scope a bit. You can widen the scope, and we we decided to use our grade ten year, um, you know, to just talk about the scale of history and go beyond just the written record of history. I, you know, if you look at the grade ten syllabus, um, you do a little bit of pre-colonial history, South African history, and um, more or less some of the empires and. The, there might be some information on archaeology, but not too much. And I mean, it goes all the way through to the American and French Revolution. So that's more or less expected of, a, of, of, of the great 10 year. Uh, but what I found, and I, I, Colin, is, he has the great 10s this year, is that, you know, that's only half the story. I, I mean, if you now think in terms of uh, modern humans and how long we've been around compared to big history and, and all of that, uh, so we decided to really dedicate the grade 10 year to just show them the, the scale of history and, um, uh, you know, all the way back and uh, going into archaeology and even beyond that. So what can we what what can we learn about the past beyond the scope of just written documents, material remains? Uh, if we now look at the fossil record, et cetera, et cetera. And, and obviously, to the extent that we, we even touch on a bit of cosmology. Um, and I must say, they, they, they really enjoy the fact that we just broaden the scope of it. Mm. And that's why, that's why, uh, you know, we, we wanted to talk to you specifically about archaeology in South Africa, because that's also a part, I think, that's, that's quite neglected. Um, you know, I mean, in, I think it's grade six and seven that they, that they do early history. Um, uh, but by that time, I, I don't think the, the maturity levels are such that you can really go into archaeology yet. You know, it's really just storytelling. Um, so I, I, I would imagine that the great ten year is, is, is a good year to expose them to archaeology. Uh, I like that you mentioned storytelling because I find a lot of the time, you know, when I talk about archaeology, especially to you know, if we're taking people on tours or if we are engaging with, um, you know, school kids, that aspect of storytelling come, brings across archaeology so nice and strongly um, because it is a story, a lot of it. It's, it's, a, it's a world that sometimes you struggle to really imagine because it was so different to our, to our own. Uh, and, and, you know, I remember when I was at school, we, we did a bit of history, um, a bit of archaeology, well, not a bit of history, did a bit of archaeology. And one of the topics we touched on was obviously Egypt being such a prominent site and yeah. prominent prehistorical record. Uh, and that was, I mean, that was an incredibly significant moment for me because it, it sort of ultimately sort of started my journey to eventually become an archaeologist. So, but yeah, I won't harp on that, Matt. I see you've got another question. Yeah, it's uh, thanks, Tim. It's 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 less of a question, more of a comment and an observation. Um, you know, when I uh, arrived at Vitz uh, in first year, and I was going to choose my subjects, and Tim Tim knows the story quite well. It's it's actually something we spoke about in our first episode ever of Bones and Stone, um, in, in terms of how we got into archaeology. I had no idea what archaeology was. I mean, I'd come out of high school and primary school not knowing what archaeology was. And, you know, when I, when I got to the orientation table for the department at, at, um, at Vitz, and I spoke to one of the professors there and said, you know, what is archaeology? It looks really cool. There were some nice pictures of some rock art behind him and some mountains and stuff and whatever. And I'd always been very interested in geography. Um, so, and, and, you know, fast forward 14 years down the line and having now specialized in archaeology, it really is an incredible discipline. Um, but I, I think that's just, it was an interesting experience, at least from my perspective, where you can have students leaving school, whether they come from private schools or public schools. I mean, my personal experience was from a public school. And I just walked into university not knowing what it is. So 
for a podcast such as yours that goes a little bit beyond the normal course curriculum and starts touching on these issues, it really is so incredible so that, you know, young scholars and students can be made aware of, you know, the different disciplines that we have, um, you know, possible career paths in, in heritage, for example, um, or, you know, where you start to specialize in, in certain types of research and then exploring, obviously, employment options at university. So I think what you're doing is just uh, really incredible and really helpful for us, at least, in terms of then trying to attract students uh, into fields like archaeology. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think that's exactly what we, it's part of what we're trying to do as well, because I don't think people realize that there are some of these niche uh, subjects that you can study. Like archaeology, I think, is misunderstood because it's, a lot of people have paleoanthropology and dinosaur bones and all those things in their heads. And having you guys on the on our podcast clear some of those things up and just showing kids that there are multiple different avenues in the study of humankind and human history is, is fantastic. I just had someone on, on the podcast who talked about film in history. And I think that it's just one of those small little things that people don't realize that history and the study of the past and all these there are so many different dimensions it's not just the old stuffy textbook archive type of thing there's so much variety and just being able to expose people to that i mean it's a great honor for us and i think you guys are doing exactly the same so i think we're we're making a good team here well maybe tim if i can ask you and matt a question Um, you know from 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 the perspective of an archaeologist uh and then obviously first years arriving at university and their ideas of archaeology, what would you expect from, from, from the school system or, or the school side, from history, you know, from history teachers in general? Mm-hmm. Um, how should they approach teaching the learners about the subject? To, to make it more relevant and, and life and lifelike, I suppose, uh, instead of you know this this misperception or conception they might have of, of, of the subject. That's a great question, you know, and, and there are a few archaeologists around who are spending a lot of time trying to answer that question and design or input archaeology into the curriculum in really meaningful ways. I think, you know, and Matt, jump in at some stage because I'm sure you have your own views as well. But one of the one of the things that I picked up from first is um, is is definitely a lack of understanding of what archaeology actually is. It's it's like you say, Colin. It's it's but dinosaur bones. You know, pe- that's what people expect. Um, people also do do um, have some sense of archaeology from from popular media, which is like Indiana Jones and you know, like The Rock now and Jumanji and things like that. Which a lot of it is obviously entirely. In, I mean, my muscles on The Rock, okay, fine, similar. But for the rest, similar. it's not. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very different to what you see in the media. And, and, and I find it at a, at a first year level, that's what I'm talking about in the, in the beginning is we're looking at popular media and we're looking at the portrayal of archaeology and then the reality of archaeology. But the, another really important thing I think it'd be great for students to be aware of is the diversity of pasts. And I use that in a plural sense because we, we tend to look at history, and I'm sure you've you found this out in your own fields as well. We look at history and we look at archaeology as these sort of singular stories or these singular truths. And that's really not the case. You know, I mean, you can break this down into so many different perspectives. And for us, at least, when you're looking at people who existed thousands of years ago, the way that we may understand and interpret an archaeological sequence, how accurate that is to reality and to how those people would have lived and and seen themselves, perhaps, and their own social systems could be very different, but might also have a lot of... um, interesting overlaps as well, you know, so we, we, I like to think of history in the plural sense that these depends who's telling the histories depend, depends who's looking at them. And so that kind of, that kind of appreciation for the past would also be really nice to sit with students and, and acknowledge that there are these multiple ways of looking at the past. Matt, I don't know if you, if you have anything you want to add in, I mean, we can obviously talk about this question for, for hours, I think, but yeah. No, I think, thanks, Tim. Yeah, I think um, you've definitely hit the nail on the head there. I think uh, most of what we do, at least initially, is, is draw on from, uh, you know, kind of public uh, or, sorry, uh, popular media uh, just to, you know, kind of expose students as to, as to what archaeology is. But I think, obviously, you know, with, with coming to university, one wants to develop that, that level of critical thinking. Um, and, and as Tim's used the example of, you know, thinking about heritage, you know, from different perspectives and trying to capture the multitude of different voices. And I think, it's such a relevant thing, given the context of our country, uh, given the fact that it has such a diverse peoples um, and the settlement history is very complex. So I think, you know, getting that point across to students is very important. So when they do arrive at university, they really have an appreciation for the um, cultural complexity and the richness of the country. 
Um, and then obviously, you know, in terms of content and stuff, it's, 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 it's not easy to, to teach content, obviously. Um, I'm sure you guys will agree, but in terms of them having a basic understanding for the complexity of the record, that would already then be there. Uh, and it, may, it would make life a little bit easier um, at university. Yeah. yeah, Matt, that first point of yours, I think is a really good one as well, because a lot of the students I find at university, and, and again, you know, someone who's decided they want to be an archaeologist may have read a few books and stuff, you know, but, but generally speaking, a lot of students see Egypt as archaeology and they see um, the Mayan history as archaeology and so on. And obviously it is um, Stonehenge and things like that. But I find there's often a perception that nothing really happened here. There was nothing of any real significance that happened in Southern Africa. Uh, and that, that's something we start to challenge in archaeology because we have incredible places like Great Zimbabwe, Matungubwe, Lombos Cave, we have rock art. There's a, there's a whole array of sites that are absolutely incredible and so this deep, very rich cult, uh, cultural and archaeological sequence. And that's, I often have students after saying, I didn't realize this was all out there. I didn't know that the rock art that hunter-gatherers are producing was as beautiful as it is and incredibly important to those people and to us today as, as it is, you know. So it's that something that I think would also be nice that, you know, students you sort of have a greater realization of the incredible archaeology we have here. Yeah, maybe if I can just quickly add something there, uh, Tim. I think what you are doing at this stage with Bones and Stones, um, just the fact that you are making archaeology accessible, uh, you know, that, that is already very significant. Because yeah. I must tell you, um, and uh, but Colin, you must tell me if you agree here, yeah, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's easier to get hold of historians in, for example, the United States and, and elsewhere to, you know, join us on the podcast than it is to get local professors or, or history professors to join us. So I think it's also a, a matter of accessibility, um, something like a YouTube channel, um, an online platform where, where learners can, where they can actually access the material. That, that yeah. is very, very necessary. Yeah, yeah, just local information, I think, is the important part. Because like I said, we use a lot of stuff. When it comes to archaeology and early humans, we have a lot of access to the Smithsonian Institute. Like, they have a lot of stuff about that. But there's not as much accessibility of local things. And I think that's what you're talking about. So, um, is it about content, delivering the type of content, or the skills to realize that they can look here for the same type of things that they were exposed to yeah. in Iraq or what have you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a, that's a great point. I mean, accessibility is, yeah, I was looking now, actually just yesterday, I was looking at uh, an article, the 20 greatest archaeological finds of 2020. And there was one listed for Africa, and it was the mummies they found recently in Egypt. That was it. And I mean, we have which, had... Which is not really Africa, is it? Yeah, it's I mean, a, that's more Mediterranean world anyway. And, and this yeah. is the cradle of humankind, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we, we've had chats about some incredible finds from last year, you know, with Steph Baker yeah. and, you know, so... Anyway, but, you know, I think that's a, a really good point. Um, I think we're going to run out of time just now and be kicked off uh, of Zoom. So, but it's a really interesting chat. Uh, and I think that what you guys are doing, and, and, and it's kind of nice how our two platforms key in together in a way. But it's really great to sort of see the archaeology being represented at a university level and, you know, at a, at a greater level than just, you know, what's in the curriculum. And getting students to, or at least having conversations that are, are thinking critically about the past. I think that's something that's really really awesome and it's, it's great to see. I, I wish you know, when I was at, at school, I had something like that to, to partake in and listen to and learn from. But, but thanks for joining us. Sorry that we have to jump. Um, we do appreciate it. Hopefully we can do some more collaborations going forward and, and maybe even you know, bring some artifacts around at some stage and, and get people to hold and touch some of these things, um, which is also oh, yeah. quite an experience. Yeah. But thanks so much. Have a good day. I hope well, you're thank not you, thank last you. too long. <laughs> thank you guys very much. Thank you. Ross. Appreciate it. All right. Cool, guys. I think we will be booted off in a moment. But yeah, no, thanks. That was really interesting. Really yeah, nice. I think you guys inspired us to, to delve even deeper into archaeology. Yes. Like oh, I said before we started the recording, I'm not doing it w nearly as enough that I need to do, you know, so I'll probably delve a little bit deeper into it now. Now that my face is on camera. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really, I mean, it's so interesting. So there's it, so many cool things to read about. And yeah. Um, and then, Tim, please, it would be great if uh, we can have you on, on High School History Recap then to, uh, but yeah. I think that episode on sand rock art, yeah. um, if you and Matt and, um, you know, you can, well, you can all join us and we can, we can have the conversation there as well. Yeah, sure. And actually, I, met, I think I have a really nice pre-created 
slideshow with rock art that I can share with you that then you could use okay. if you wanted to do that as well. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, absolutely. that would be great. Even as a PDF to circulate to people or something along those lines. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. cool so I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah, no, please do. Just drop me a mail. Yeah. Will do. Like All right. Cool. Enjoy okay. the rest okay. of the day. Great stuff. Thanks, right, thanks Thank guys. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.